Boya, a man with more than 20 years flying experience under his wing, so to speak, saw something extraordinary which later made those headlines as he flew at 4,000 feet 
near Guernsey. And so did quite a few of his passengers, and so did the pilot of another aircraft that was flying nearby, flying over Sark. And Captain Bowyer is here now to, to tell his story. Thank you for coming in, and thank you for speaking out, because I know from private conversations I've had over the years with the commercial pilots, sometimes when I'm up in the cockpit with them, they do see things, mm -hmm. um, and, they, and they tend not to report them because they don't want to be laughed at or have their careers jeopardised. Exactly um, right, so no. why have you decided to speak out about it? Well, I, I didn't actually decide uh, to speak out at all. Actually, the press <laughs> asked the company, which I work for, mm -hmm. um, to would I mind doing an interview, and the company, being uh, quite, quite a forward-thinking firm, uh, had no objection. In fact, uh, pretty much actively encouraged it. So that's what? how it happened, really. Well, how did the press get hold of it then? Did, did passengers? I don't know. I really don't you, know. You weren't the only person who saw no. this phenomenon, that's right. were you? There, no. there, there were some passengers who saw it, and yeah. also another pilot. Yes. Simultaneously. Well, look, let's. We've got an artist's impression that we knocked up here this afternoon on our, our computer paint box. Um, is that kind of what you saw? Is that a uh, reasonable? No. <laughs> oh, well, which is the best we did. Oh, be honest, yeah. You, well, hold that picture. Well, it's you, pretty you, you, you describe it, it to us. Well, it was a, a brilliant uh, yellow object. The, the brightness you've got there, about two-thirds from left to right, um, yeah, but it was a graphite grey uh, section, if you want to call it a fuselage. We don't know yet what it was. Or we're looking into it. And how big was it? Uh, it's difficult to say once again, but I saw it from 50 miles away. So um, any object from 50 miles away must have been fairly enormous. Well, what, about a mile long? It's possible, yeah. Did it it's, move at all? It probably didn't move, but uh, there, I had uh, the great opportunity the other day from Jersey Air Traffic Control uh, visiting their radar uh, room and uh, some interesting um, traces, let's put it that way, from, from the radar. Uh, really? Indicate that there's a possibility that they did pick up on, from both Guernsey and Jersey radar uh, traces, uh, spurious traces they call, um, for around about 55 minutes. How long uh, did you see it for? I saw it in total for 12 minutes. Can I show you a picture? Um, mm. this is, I'm sure you've seen this picture. It's of lenticular clouds, um, a very rare but, but known <clears throat> formation. This was yep. taken some years ago. Could it have been something like that? Could it have been some very, very strangely formed cloud? Do you think? Uh, no. Well, I think highly unlikely. Uh, I've seen lots of lenticularis in my time, um, mm -hmm. um, but just doesn't look like a cloud. Well, really. you've seen a lot of clouds yeah. over the last few years. I also had the opportunity of looking at this or these objects, there were two of them, mm -hmm. uh, through binoculars, uh, ten times magnification, and uh, in my view, a very definite object uh, in, inside controlled airspace, uh, which shouldn't have been there. What happened? Did, did you simply lose contact with it? Did it disappear? Well, I, I was it... landing, I was, it was a general flight from, uh, from Southampton, going mm -hmm. to Alderney, and the only reason I lost sight of it uh, was because I descended through a haze layer, which uh, mm -hmm. is fairly common yeah. in that area, and having descended through the haze layer, I couldn't, uh, couldn't see it anymore, but it's almost certainly still there. Did well, the other pilot was... who was flying over Sark, the, the island of Sark, did he mm -hmm. report it in exactly the same terms? Yes, because it was sighted, or they were sighted in uh, in inside controlled airspace, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the pilot's under a legal obligation, and I suspect this is where uh, the, the press has come from. And yeah. uh, he's, he's filed a report exactly the same as I have. Um, well, let's, show you, let's show you a couple of pictures from, from the UFO file books. These are, these are genuine UFOs in the sense that no one's ever been able to explain what they are, but they, they, they happen. They're not fakes. Well, that's, uh, that's over well, New I must Mexico. Say that's uh, very similar to is the it? sort of thing that I saw, yeah. Well, that and, was, and my passengers. That was famously. Uh, I haven't seen taken over before. New Mexico right. um, in 1957, and okay. it's not a cloud. That much we do know. I don't know what it is, but it's but not they, a cloud. Not a cloud. Uh, analysis showed that it wasn't a cloud, but they don't know what it was, uh, mm -hmm. hence UFO. Yeah. This is one from Russia uh, in 1989. Again, analysis shows it's a genuine object. It's not a cloud. There is a cloud above it, a faint one, but uh, that object is not a cloud. Again, is that something? Um, well, I'd say the object I saw was, was a very brilliant uh, yellow Much brighter colour. Yeah, much brighter. It's emitting yeah. light. But it was emitting. You think it was no, emitting? So. Light. Well, it, well, there was there was cloud above it and all the way down to Guernsey. And, so it couldn't uh, have been reflecting not, not sunlight. Reflect, then. Yeah. Well, that was that was what I first thought before I looked at it through the binoculars. That uh, th there's a lot of vineries called vine greenhouses in Guernsey, and uh, the sun may have been reflecting from one of these vineries to the aircraft. They, you often see them in France as well uh, on the way down to the to Channel Islands, mm. Mm. and uh, they because the aircraft moves position and these the reflections are fixed in place, they often disappear. They always disappear. If you this to... one didn't disappear, it just stayed stationary. If you had to take an instinctive guess, and I'm saying it's guess, so I'm not asking for professionals because how could you possibly know? Would you say that it was something of this planet or something from outer space? <sighs> Extremely difficult. I mean, uh, I think a few years ago you interviewed Dr. David Clark on a very similar sort of yes, thing. He did, yeah. About four years ago, I spoke to him today. He's in, in charge of a team that's looking into this at the moment. Um, I have been asked a question by the press, and my simple answer was uh, I don't think it's from around here. Um, okay. I can't speculate any further than that. But there is some information which is now being looked at, and uh, hopefully better come back one day and give you an answer to this. But at the moment, it's...
Well, is I that, have to, it's, that, it's an unknown. When, when you fly now, I mean, do you have a sort of slightly heightened awareness of what may be going on <laughs> around you? Uh, I think, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, It's not the first object I've seen, personally, and I've spoken to a lot of other commercial pilots since this uh, mm. has yeah. happened, and they've said on the quiet, you know, come round the corner, I want to tell you about what I Absolutely. saw. Absolutely. And I, I think what's going to happen yeah. now, this may have opened the can, and mm. I think uh, what all professional pilots out there ought to be looking at is actually reporting everything they see and actually getting it yes. itemised and written into the CAA and then perhaps we will find Well, I have to say, the unofficial first-hand accounts I've, as I say, had from professional pilots, yeah. many of them with as much experience as you have, and they're, they're not put, putting me on, you know, yeah. um, are extraordinary. Some things that, that, that some guys have seen. Yeah. Some see nothing in their yeah. entire career. Yeah. Um, we interviewed a British Airways pilot who also came out in the 1960s. He saw a silver disc, didn't he? He picked it up on his radar. It was mm -hmm. picked up on ground radar over the Bay of Biscay. Right. Um, pretty big, and it travelled at immense speed, yeah. way faster than the speed of sound, and disappeared under his right wing. And it was a round silver disc, you know, like they're supposed to be. Extraordinary. Well, this, exactly. this object looked like a CD disc on edge, if you like, uh, yeah. but very sharp and extremely well defined. Well, thank you very thank much you for very coming well. in and describing it to us. That's very fascinating. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Swiss Air 127 Heavy Boston Center, good afternoon. Just verify you have the Norwich 2 arrival to Boston. Hey, Tom. Roger. The center is Swiss Air 127. Swiss Air 127, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. I don't know what it was, but it, it just over to like like a couple of hundred feet above us. It was like, like, you know, I don't know if it was a rocket or whatever, but incredibly fast, uh, opposite direction. In the opposite direction? Yes, sir. And the time was what two one zero seven. It was it was too fast to be an airplane. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Nine eight six Boston Center. The center maintain flight level one eight zero. Down to one eight zero. Yes, sir. Nine eight six. Yes, sir. Nine eight six. You see anything uh, like a missile in your area, perhaps off to your right? Take a good look, but I don't think if it's going that fast, I probably won't get a chance. We just saw a there go by a little bit ago. Okay. Thanks. One a UFO mystery at one of the nation's busiest airports. Several pilots, apparently, and United Airlines workers at Chicago's O'Hare swear they saw one, a UFO. They say it hovered over a terminal without lights before shooting straight up right through the clouds last fall. The FAA still is investigating, but federal officials believe it was just some strange weather phenomenon. The UFO hair story the Chicago Tribune exclusively broke on New Year's Day is garnering attention around the world. Joining us now to talk about it once again is Tribune transportation writer John Hilkovich, who broke the story. And John, the response has been, well, out of this world, hasn't it? Yes, it has been astronomical, Jim. Uh, every major country, it seems, people have written in, uh, both those who claim they've uh, spotted UFOs during their life, as well as serious researchers. I mean, just the last two days, this is my email, and these are the serious emails, uh, you know, the ones from Kooks who said they were brought aboard alien spacecraft I put in a circular file. So it's wow. just a story that has legs, and people are fascinated by the thought, and I think there's some belief that there are advanced life forms that are visiting us here on a regular basis. You've been contacted now in the last few days by several countries, but that also includes serious university researchers here in the U.S. You know, I've got to tell you, too, I got a call from my dad in California Monday night, and he's like, what is up with the O'Hare UFO story? I'm like, where did you see that? Where did you read that? Well, it was on Fox Network's crawl mm -hmm. at the bottom. It's just amazing how much this is garnering. Yeah, it really is, and uh, worldwide uh, attention, as you say, and uh, from people who have observed, made observations themselves, including on November 7th, the date of this incident, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, additional people both at O'Hare and outside the airport who have either seen this gray disc-shaped metallic object themselves mm -hmm. or they saw that huge hole in the sky that, that the object created when it vanished. Let's go over that one more time. What did people see when it all of a sudden vanished right through the, the clouds over the United Terminal and then how's the FAA been reacting uh, the past few days too? Any, any new ground on that? Okay. Well the object was hovering in a stationary position about 1500 feet above the United Terminal for some minutes and then when it left, it just burst through this uh, thick cloud layer 
uh, creating a, a large open space of, of blue sky on an otherwise overcast day. Uh, it took some minutes for that uh, opening to close up when the clouds drifted back together. And it's just extremely unusual, according to the witnesses. I mean, airplanes just don't react like this. They slice through clouds, and they really don't disturb the atmosphere that much, except for the wingtips and such. Mm -hmm. uh, the FAA is still, uh, you know, pinning this to a, uh, a some kind of weather phenomenon, that some lights from the airport and the overcast sky somehow got together and created this image. But uh, weather experts, uh, ast astronomy experts, others that I've talked to said that that's, uh, that's bunk. Uh, a, that's, that explanation just doesn't wash. United, on the other hand, uh, after first denying that they got any reports from employees about this sighting, is now saying, uh, yes, indeed, their employees did approach them immediately because mm -hmm. of concerns about safety. And to reiterate, John, the witnesses who originally came to you are all seasoned, professional, credible professionals like pilots who saw this. They're this pilots, one. they're senior managers, they're mechanics. And others, so uh, you know they are they are very truthful <laughs> about what they're saying, and we're trying to locate photographs if they do exist of this incident. Well, John, we know you have plenty of other interviews to do today with other countries, so we'll let you go, and we'll keep our eyes to the sky. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. For an event that never happened, FAA official John Callahan certainly has a lot of evidence. They brought the voice tapes. He kept audio recordings between the cockpit and the tower as the incident unfolded. He has 30 minutes of taped radar that confirms the UFO, a chart that documents all the objects in the 747's flight path, and the official FAA report. Event that never happened. According to Callahan, all of this was presented to the CIA in a private meeting. When the pilot first reported the UFO, he described it as a huge ball with lights running around it. He said it was about four times bigger than the 747 he was riding. And remember, the 747 has an elevator. And he's looking out the window and he sees something that's four times the size of his aircraft. What you're about to see and hear are excerpts from the actual radar and cockpit conversations as the incident unfolded. It was a very beautiful weather. We were approaching Paris, and uh, the steward who was in the cockpit said, uh, "Oh, a weather balloon." So it was the steward who first said there's a weather balloon there, yeah. and then the co-pilot yeah, yeah. who said there was something there, yeah, and yeah. that's what directed After your attention. I saw it, to. yes, it was on our left, and we look, we, we look at this object during uh, one or two minutes. Though Captain Dubach's steward and co-pilot initially think they've spotted a rogue weather balloon, they quickly change their minds. The object is far too large. And it was at roughly the same altitude you were saying? It, that oh, it's below us. It was below us. Below you? Below us. But how many feet below you? Oh, uh, 4,000 feet. We are 39. It was about 35,000 feet. And so it was really surprising. The dimension was huge. 
absolutely huge because the, the, the distance was about 25 miles and at 25 miles you cannot see a plane. When did you realize it wasn't a plane? We all uh, immediately uh, identified this object as not a plane. It was different of a plane or a balloon or something. It was absolutely abnormal. It was a uh, red balloon with a uh, red color, very, very curious. And it was uh, some kind of haze. Captain Dubok describes the red-brown disc as having a strange haze or fuzziness at its edges. And as he watches, he says it appears to be banking at a 45 degree angle. He estimates its size to be between 800 and 1,000 feet, or more than six times the size of his own jetliner. But what happens next is even more surprising. Uh, so after one minute, it became transparent and disappeared. So did it disappear quickly or gradually become transparent? Oh, it, it, it became uh, gradually transparent. What was the conversation in the cockpit of the plane about this? Yes, it was. Uh, what was it thing? It's impossible to create such a huge uh, ship and which able to disappear like that with such a fuzzy uh, characteristic, with this color and this appearance. We cannot do that. Captain Dubok radios in his sighting immediately to REMS air traffic control in northern France. They confirm his sighting with radar from CODA, the operational center of air defense. Their radar registers a nearly one minute hit, which crosses the path of Captain Dubok's Air France flight and then disappears. Despite the surprising detail, Captain Dubok remains silent for three years after his sighting. Neither his co-pilot nor his steward make a report. But in 1997, he finally comes forward with his story. Two years later, it becomes one of the top cases in the Cometa report, a 1999 document put forth by an independent defense think tank and sent to the French government. The report uses well-documented sightings, such as Captain Dubox, to make the case that UFOs need to be treated seriously and as a matter of national security. Were you impressed by the conclusions of the Cometa report that these were military issues that had to be addressed? Yes, yes, I was very impressed. I realized it was beyond all everything I could imagine. It was uh, really, really crazy. We cannot imagine the technology. And that's the message of the Cometa report itself, isn't it? Yes. The Cometa report basically just says that we can no longer ignore the extraterrestrial exactly. hypothesis. Exactly. The report concludes, quote, these studies demonstrate the almost certain physical reality of completely unknown flying objects. They must be the subject of indispensable speculations and the development of prospective scenarios. <laughs>